As noted, I will be showing some cases and hopefully wrapping up the various concepts that have already been discussed. The first case, I will be showing seven cases in total. The first case is a 51-year-old woman who presents for screening mammography, which will be probably the bulk of the exams that you will see. These are her mammograms, and when you have screening mammography, as we know, we take two views of each breast, the MLO, which is the medial lateral oblique, and the cranial cauda, which is the CC view. These are the medial lateral oblique. I have termed these right and left, but the side is uh, variable, depends how you hang your films at your institution. You should probably look for the labels in terms of telling you which breast it is. But these are the MLOs because you know you have the pectoral muscles coming down. And then here are the cranial caudal views. And by convention, of course, you have the superior part being the upper, lower, and outer and inner breast. So we are looking for an abnormality, and at mammography screening in particular, we are looking for subclinical cancers when they are early stage and favorable prognosis and hopefully make a clinical difference in terms of detection. We are looking for masses, calcifications, architectural distortion, and developing asymmetries as mammographic signs of malignancy. So do we see any of those signs here in this patient? And we do, and we're focusing on this particular breast, and the finding of interest is a mass. And here is the mass which is localized in the upper, outer, posterior breast, and it's important to localize this in two projections so that you can properly localize it uh, for interventional procedures and also before that when you do your targeted ultrasound. And this is a mass because this is a lesion that is seen in two or more views. It is densest at the center, and it has convex as opposed to concave margins. And here are the photographic enlargements. You can do spot compression views or spot compression magnification views to better visualize the lesion of interest. And these are spot compression magnification views. And indeed, this has fulfilled the criteria of a mass in the sense that we have identified it in two views at least. It is densest at the center and has convex margins. Next, you look at the shape and the margin of this mass. I would say the shape is irregular and the margin is speculated, and these are terminology from the BIRADS lexicon, which is the language that we should be using for reporting breast lesions, both of which are suspicious finding. And then you go on to do an ultrasound to determine whether this is a cyst or solid, and is this a cyst? Well, it is not a simple cyst. A simple cyst would be anechoic, it would have smooth walls, and it would have posterior acoustic enhancement. And this lesion really have none of those features in the sense that it is hypoechoic, not anechoic. The walls are irregular, and there is no particular posterior acoustic enhancement. Is it a complicated cyst? We don't think this is a complicated cyst because it does not fulfill the criteria of a simple cyst except for the presence of internal echoes. So which leaves this as a solid mass. And because the margin and shape are both suspicious, it makes this a suspicious solid mass. BIRADS 4 suspicious, need for biopsy, or even BIRADS 5 highly suggestive of malignancy. This particular case, you can sample this through some sort of ultrasound-guided intervention. Core biopsy is probably the standard that most of us will use in the United States. And you can see the needle traversing into the lesion. This is the echogenic line. That's a nice feature you have in the sense that you can visualize what's happening at real time. You can um, turn the transducer and make sure that the needle does traverse the mass in orthogonal projections. You get tissue out. And then you can even leave a clip in there to document that you have properly biopsied the mass and that the sonographic mass that you've identified indeed correlates with the mammographic mass that you found at screening, which in this case you do, as you can see. The echogenic clip is right here, which appears radio opaque and mammography within the mass and mammography. So that is a case of invasive ductal carcinoma. The teaching points are summarized on the slides at the end of each case. In this particular case, you want to look for whatever finding you are looking for in two or more views. And in this case, we're looking for a mass. And remember, you are looking for mass, calcifications, architectural distortion, or developing asymmetries, or a combination of those sometimes. And in this particular case, a mass is seen in two or more views, densest at the center, convex margins. You want to assess for the shape 
and the margin of a mass, then you want to do ultrasound after you properly localized it in three-dimensional world to determine whether it is a cyst or solid. And if it is a cyst, you want to think whether it is a simple cyst or a complicated cyst. And the aspiration part comes in when you are not sure whether it is a complicated cyst or a solid mass that mimics a complicated cyst. You want to use ultrasound to guide your biopsy. And the clip placement is helpful for subsequent localization, but also helpful to help correlate your mammographic and your sonographic findings. So invasive ductal carcinoma in this case, which is your most common histology in terms of invasive cancers. Okay, case two, this is a 70-year-old woman who presents with a palpable lump of unknown duration. Age matters in a sense that the number one predictor of a malignancy, aside from gender, which is the female sex, is age. That is, cancer increases as the woman gets older. This is a patient who is 70, and she presents with a fairly large mass. Ultrasound was performed, and this is the ultrasound that was seen. So is this a cyst or is this solid? Is this a simple cyst or a complicated cyst or a complex mass? This is probably best defined as a complex mass in the sense that you have mixed solid components and cystic components. Differential includes evolving hematoma or abscess, but you need a proper clinical history for those diagnoses, meaning some sort of history of trauma or anticoagulation for typically for hematoma, and abscess, of course, clinical signs and symptoms of infection, neither of which we have in this particular case. This is a palpable lump that the patient's otherwise asymptomatic. Now, it turns out that this was a rather large mass that was palpable, and the clinician already tried aspiration in the office without ultrasound guidance. Non-specific fluid was obtained, but there was quite a bit of a mass that was left over still. So the question that was asked of the radiologist was, is this a hematoma that is a consequence of the aspiration, or is this something else? And Given the fact that this is very complex looking, we are thinking that it's more than just a fresh hematoma and that this is something else. Remember the BIRADS term is that this is a complex mass. That's what BIRADS wants us to say. The older term for this lesion was complex cystic mass. But with BIRADS for ultrasound, which was published in November 2003, the term complex mass was developed so as to not to comp confuse it with a complicated cyst. There's something else in this case, which are these echogenic foci. You probably talked about Stafros criteria already. One of the original descriptors was echogenic foci, puncte calcifications as a sign of malignancy. Nowadays, that's a bit of a confusing term in the sense that we mammographers think of punctate calcifications as benign, but when we say punctate calcifications at ultrasound, we sort of mean suspicious. And these are what we see, the little, little dots that you have at uh, ultrasound. Of course, the best test for visualization of calcifications is still mammography, not ultrasound, not MRI. And you want to do a mammogram on this patient. And here is her mammogram. So this is the mass. In this breast, that is abnormal. It is radiodense, which is a sign of malignancy. It doesn't have to be, but you're sort of thinking it is. You want to look at the shape and the margin, but we already know this is a fairly suspicious finding because of the complex nature, because of the absence of a good clinical history or findings for hematoma or abscess. And these echogenic foci corresponds to the calcification seen within the mass. This mass is quite dense so that I have to show you photographic enlargements before you see calcifications well. And here is the correlating image in the cranial caudal view. Localization, upper, inner breast. Not so challenging in this case because the lesion is large, but very important in general when you are assessing mammographic lesions. And this is the photographic enlargement of the mass itself. It is then such that the rest of the breast parenchyma is uh, overpenetrated in order for us to see well the calcifications. And the calcifications of question are located here in the MLO and here in the CC. When you analyze calcifications, you want to look for the morphology 
or the shape of the calcifications, and the distribution of the calcifications, how they are arranged with respect to each other in three-dimensional space. You want to use Byrad's terminology to describe both the morphology and distribution of calcifications. So the morphology here would be, I would say linear, some of you may say branching, some of you may say heterogeneous, maybe even pleomorphic. All those are acceptable terms, but we want to convey that this is a suspicious finding, which is what I think all of us would agree on. I personally would choose linear, and the distribution, also linear. Linear is both a morphology and a distribution word when you look at the Byrad's lexicon for calcifications. So linear distribution, linear morphology, both of which connote malignancy. And you want to choose adjectives or descriptors that convey what you do, because most of what we do is about the management, which is your BIRAS assessment category, either four suspicious in this case, or five highly suggestive of malignancy. Just depends on your style. But you don't want to call this BIRADS too benign, and you do not want to call this BIRADS three probably benign. Those would be wrong answers. And this allows us to guide our needle into biopsying the solid parts. Remember the clinician already tried aspiration, but only got nonspecific fluid, probably because the needle ended up in the cystic component. So there is a role for ultrasound guided procedure, even in the setting of an easily palpable lesion. Again, here's the echogenic line, that is the needle. And you can turn Doppler on to help you find, if you will, the solid components to go after for biopsy. Because sometimes debris and solid tissue can be confused with each other based on grayscale imaging alone. And the presence of Doppler suggests that there is uh, vascularity and that there is tissue, solid tissue. And this diagnosis at core biopsy was invasive ductal carcinoma, poorly differentiated or grade three with necrosis, which is your cystic components. This patient happened to get an MR as well. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy was being considered, and generally as a baseline, you would get an MR because generally you follow neoadjuvant chemotherapy patients with MRI, which is one of the clearly established clinical indications for breast MR. And these are axial images, 3D gradient echo with fat saturation. This is pre-contrast injection, after and delay, so get contrast being gadolinium, of course, in MR. And then I show you here a fast spin echo T2 weighted images before the injection of contrast, simply to show you the hyper-intense parts on T2 weighted imaging, which is your cystic components. So you see here a beautiful rim enhancement, which is a very classic finding for MRI. As you know, one of the relative limitations of breast MR is the relative lack or low specificity. But rim enhancement in the proper clinical setting is very specific for cancer, meaning I have a palpable lump. Uh, I don't know if it's a benign fibroadenoma or a malignant cancer. And if I see rim enhancement, I'm strongly thinking that it is a cancer. What is this black dot? That is the clip that uh, is a signal void on MR that you place because oftentimes the new adjuvant chemotherapy patients, these lesions hopefully will shrink and sometimes shrink to uh, very difficult to see so then you want a marker for subsequent surgical excision. This is another section through the same lesion, again demonstrating the beautiful rim enhancement. Notice that on delayed imaging, it's brighter than the immediately post-contrast enhancement. That's okay, meaning this lesion is not showing washout. It is showing rather type one persistent enhancement. That's still okay because the majority of cancers you're gonna see are not gonna show washout. Washout is for the cancer that behaves as the textbook tells you, which is not, but not all cancers will stay home and read the textbook. What's important is that you have strong initial enhancement and of course everything else, the clinical presentation, mammographic and sonographic findings. Just to show you how she responds, she responded very well. This is her baseline, this is her after four cycles of chemotherapy. And this is her on the CC and with nice response. Notice that the mass component has decreased, although the calcifications have remained stable, which is typically what you see with response. 
So to review, this is a case of an invasive ductal carcinoma that has responded to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Complex mass, remember, by rats lexicon is one that shows cystic and solid components, as opposed to a complicated cyst is one that's a cyst, really, but contains internal echoes. Complex mass, when you use that term, you are thinking malignancy, or higher chance of malignancy at least, then when you say complicated cyst, you're sort of implying that you believe it is a benign lesion, though you may recommend aspiration for confirmation that it is a complicated cyst. When you are analyzing calcifications, you want to look for both morphology of the calcifications and the distribution of the calcifications. Beware of necrotic lesions mimicking cysts. Doppler may aid in differentiated hypoechoic debris from hypoechoic solid components within a mass. And after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that is preoperative chemotherapy, the mass may decrease, but calcifications generally remain constant, or they may even increase. Don't be fooled. Just because the calcifications have increased does not mean that the patient is not responding. That just means that you have cell death, turnover, and uh, the deposit of dystrophic calcifications. And that's why MR is really the gold standard for follow-up of these patients, as opposed to mammography. Which leads us to our next case, case three, a 32-year-old woman who presents with a palpable lump of one week duration. This is her mammograms. She's young, her breasts are dense. I would say this is bi rats density for extremely dense. Remember you have sort of two types of bi rats categories. There are the density categories, which is one fatty, two scattered fibroglandular densities, three heterogeneously dense, and four extremely dense. And then you have your assessment categories, which is the one thing you must put in your BIRADS report according to MQSA. And that is, of course, BIRADS 0, incomplete, needs additional imaging assessment. BIRADS 1 negative, 2 benign, 3 probably benign, 4 suspicious, 5 highly suggestive of malignancy, and 6 known malignancy, biopsy proven cancer. So here you have a BIRADS density 4, extremely dense breast. MLO on your left, CC on your right, and her lump is somewhere in the lower inner breast, which photographic enlargement on these areas on spot compression magnification shows mass, calcifications, architectural distortion, developing asymmetry. Well, at least we have calcifications, which are here and here, and some of us may even say we have a mass. Uh, it depends on definition. Do we really have a lesion? Maybe, maybe not, but we at least have calcifications. And remember, morphology distribution. Morphology, I would say amorphous, some may say heterogeneous, pleomorphic, and distribution, I think clustered. And all the more important because this correlates with her palpable lump, which adds an increased level of clinical suspicion to any mammographic finding that you will see. Um, when you do ultrasound, you will see readily that there is a mass, which in retrospect is this, hard to see because her breast is so dense, and that's where ultrasound can really be helpful in identifying the mass that is difficult to visualize at mammography. One of the reasons is that you are looking for contrast at breast imaging. The mass, especially cancers, typically look white. Dense tissue looks white. So white against a white background is hard to see. But when you look at ultrasound, typically the cancer is hypoechoic. Stavros talks about market hypoechogenicity as a sign of malignancy. And happens because of the physics of ultrasound that dense tissue looks relatively hyperechoic. So that's good in the sense that we can more readily see a cancer that's hypoechoic against a relatively hyperechoic backdrop. And additionally, you see these echogenic foci, which corresponds to the calcifications that you identified at mammography. So this is a suspicious lesion. You put Doppler on, you have lots of vascularity. This is, again, suggestive of, consistent with a cancer. You don't have to have vascularity and have a cancer. And you could have fibroanomas that have lots of vascularity. So there is some overlap. And hence, Doppler is not a required part of 
breast imaging evaluation of solid masses. But when you do see it, it does support the diagnosis of a cancer. Now, it turns out that when you move the transducer a little bit, you're going to see a second lesion that's smaller. This was at 4 o'clock. It, this is the right breast, the way I've hung the films. So that's the lower inner. And here's the upper inner. Excuse me, this is the uh, 2 o'clock. So it is the upper inner. And in retrospect, she has calcifications a little further away that corresponds to that second lesion, ever so difficult to identify at mammography because of her dense breast. This is her initial diagnosis mammograms. Here is her target lesion with which she presented, the palpable lump. And she has just a bit of calcifications at the 2 o'clock position, which after chemotherapy have actually increased a great bit. We put in metallic clips after the ultrasound biopsy, the 4 o'clock lesion, the 2 o'clock lesion, and you can see that after the four cycles of chemotherapy, the calcifications have actually increased in her case. Representing dystrophic reaction does not mean she's not responding because she did, um, and you can see that the second site also has increased calcifications so that you can easily see it now. And that's why some institutions would do ultrasound for staging to look for multicentric or multifocal disease. And this is her CC view. Mass may be seen at ultrasound even if only calcifications are seen in mammography. And when you do see it at ultrasound, then you may then biopsy it using sonographic guidance. When you see one cancer, you want to find additional sites of disease because that will make a difference in, med medical manage in medical and surgical management. If you see more than one site of disease, you may do a larger lumpectomy or you may even do a mastectomy. Punctate echogenic foci usually translates into suspicious calcifications. The coarse calcifications don't look like punctate foci at ultrasound. But you always want to do your mammography, particularly your magnification mammography, for this analysis. Calcifications represent dystrophic reaction, and they may increase even if the cancer responds to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Case four, this is a 50-year-old woman who presents for screening mammography. These are her mammograms. She's asymptomatic, going about her day just fine. Bilateral MLOs on your left bilateral CCs on your right. So we're looking for a cancer. Again, masses, calcifications, architecture distortion, developing asymmetry on every case you approach. Her breasts are by rats three density, I would say, heterogeneously dense. Some of you may say two, some of you may say four, that's okay. But you know, on the denser side probably. And what we're looking at is that cancer at the edge of the film. Medial, breast, posterior, very hard to image, and a classic miss, if you will, in terms of difficult locations, similar to sort of like the subdiaphragmatic area or the retrocardiac region of an, on a chest x-ray, that kind of uh, area that's hard to see. That's what that looks like. Now, sternalis is a consideration, right? Because the sternalis muscle inserts there. Could be, but not definitely enough. You may, so you want to recall this patient. Sternalis looks like a sail sign, triangle. It's usually quite sharp, well delineated, which is not the case here. And when she came back, you pull more, there's actually a mass. And there it is. At ultrasound, you're going to see this as a solid mass, but look at here. This is an irregular mass, a mammography, ill-defined margins, I would say this. At ultrasound, it's angular. Angular margin is more of a sonographic term. Mammographically, I would say ill-defined, irregular. And here is the ultrasound. Is this shadowing? Is this a second lesion down here? No, you don't want it before because here is the um, rib that is underlying. Here's the pectoral muscle. So you're really close to the pectoral muscle and the chest wall. Remember, this is a very posterior lesion. And this here is the angular margin that you saw at Mammography. So this is a BIRATS-5 highly suggestive of malignancy mass. And you do MR for several reasons here. You can do it for local staging. In this particular case, it was done to exclude involvement of pectoral muscle. And that's a pertinent negative that is con a contributory for the patient's management. Involvement of tumor in the pectoral muscle is a bad prognostic indicator. And you almost always give neoadjuvant chemotherapy in that setting. Well, here is your mass at MR. Remember at mass, uh, excuse me, at MRI, you're looking for enhancing mass versus non-mass enhancement. 
and those are your BIRAD's terms for breast MR. And which is it in this case? I would say this is an enhancing mass. What's an enhancing mass at MR? Well, it's a mass that enhances, a mass being the same mass as you have at mammography and at ultrasound. I would say shape is irregular, and enhancement characteristic is rim. We already talked about rib enhancement as a specific sign of malignancy at breast MR. So here it is, rim enhancement, showing some washout in this particular case, which would classify it as a type 3 kinetics on delayed imaging. But what you're looking for is involvement of the pectoral muscle. It's closely located, it juxtaposes, it even abuts the pectoral muscle with effacement of the fat plane but I do not see enhancement of the pectoral muscle, which has shown to be a sensitive and specific sign of pectoral muscle involvement by tumor. So I would tell the surgeon, it closely abuts, the surgeon probably will take the pectoral fascia, but this patient probably has no pectoral muscle involvement and will not get neoadjuvant chemotherapy unless there are other clinical indications. Another reason for MR in this case is to assess for extent of disease. Are there other areas involved in this breast? And the answer is yes, because near that primary cancer, you have this, which is non-mass enhancement. And you look at the distribution of non-mass enhancement. In this case, I would say it is segmental. That is similar to segmental in terms of the word you use for distribution of calcifications, kind of in a triangular area. This represents DCIS, that is next to the invasive ductal carcinoma. And further out laterally, you see accessory findings, which is lymphadenopathy. So you know there's tumor involvement of the nodes in this particular patient. It is not 100% in the sense that you could have reactive, but it is very high chance that this is actually tumor. This is a case of invasive ductal carcinoma and DCIS and axillary lymphadenopathy. You want to look for lesions at the edge of the view, particularly at screening, just like you look for lesions at any radiographic studies at the edge. Angular margin at ultrasound is highly suggestive of malignancy. MRI is helpful in assessing extent of disease, both looking for multicentric, multifocal disease and pectoral muscle involvement, and therefore help the surgeon in terms of his or her planning. And when you're dealing with cancer at MR, you're looking at enhancing mass versus non-mass enhancement. Case five is a 55-year-old woman who presents for screening mammography with a palpable lump in retrospect. And this is her. She has an implant, which makes everything difficult, more difficult. First thing that catches your eye probably are these bright dots. Here is the photographic enlargement. You should learn what benign calcifications look like so you can dismiss them quickly. This would be a BIRADS-2 benign capsular calcifications. They are coarse, they're oriented along the outline of this implant. But her palpable lump that is in retrospect identified is in the contralateral breast. And it is here in the outer aspect. Is that capsular calcifications? Is that fibroadenoma? You know, fibroadenoma can be associated with calcifications. When you look closer, the margin suggests that it is ill-defined, not typical for a fibroadenoma. So what you can do next is implant displaced views, or also known as Eklund views, but we prefer the term implant displaced nowadays. So these are pushing the implants away, and you see a mass identified in two views that is irregular, and these lines coming out speculated. Speculated, bad word to us, breast imagers at mammography, ultrasound, and MR. So you're thinking that this is a cancer. And indeed, ultrasound shows a highly suggestive of malignancy finding. It is markedly hypoechoic with posterior acoustic shadowing. These are echogenic foci that correlate it with your calcifications. You can use your ultrasound needle now okay, to biopsy because you can watch the needle in the real time. So lesson here is that benign and malignant lesions can coexist in the same patient, even in the same breast. In this particular case, we have them in different breasts, but you can have benign calcifications and malignant findings in the same breast, of course. Beware of the satisfaction of search, meaning you don't want to just see the capsule calcifications and not think about the suspicious cancerous calcifications on the other side. You want to perform implant displaced views when appropriate, Coarse calcifications in a setting of a mass is suspicious, 
and posterior acoustic shadowing at ultrasound is suspicious. Next case is a 62-year-old woman who presents with a palpable lump of two-week duration, and this is her. We see another calcified mass, and of course, her palpable lump is here, what I call the left breast. Look for the accessory findings, which in her case is skin thickening diffusely and a little bit of skin indentation. Now, you have something on the other side. That's a popcorn calcification, hyalinized fibroadenoma. But you don't want it to be distracted, and you won't be, because this is a fairly obvious finding. And here she is on CC with skin indentation. These are her photographic enlargements, beautiful linear branching calcifications, distribution, linear, clustered, all of the above is a large area. She has an irregular speculated mass. All of this is suspicious. And here she is at ultrasound, very heterogeneous. This is your angular margin. These are your beautiful linear calcifications. And you can, again, use this to guide your needle. Vascularity at Doppler imaging. And when you look elsewhere, you actually see axillary nodes that are abnormal. So now we have sort of wrapped up the picture for the surgeon. She presented with inflammatory symptoms, inflammatory breast carcinoma. That accounts for the skin thickening. That means that you have uh, involvement of the dermal lymphatics with tumor, axial lymphadenopathy, high-grade invasive ductal carcinoma at biopsy. So coarse calcifications, yes, that's a fibroadenoma, but the linear branching ones are malignant. You want to look for those secondary signs. Skin thickening, which represents inflammatory breast in her case, the differential being local extension of tumor to the adjacent skin, and then axillary lymphadenopathy involving tumor. And last case, just for the last two minutes or so, this is a 75-year-old woman who presents for screening mammography. Masses on both sides. I've only shown you the MLOs now, but here's the CC. You have a mass in this breast, which has a coarse calcification. I'm going to tell you it's been there for 15 years. She's 75 years old. She's had mammograms since she was 70, excuse me, 60. She's not on hormone. She's postmenopausal. What we're looking at is this finding here in the lower inner breast is a mass. And three years ago, you have that. These are both CC views getting bigger, right? Bigger in generally is bad at breast imaging. Doesn't have to be, but you're sort of thinking bad until proven otherwise. And indeed, the margins of this now, th currently, doesn't look so good, looks ill-defined. And this is her on the lateral projection, speculated, ill-defined. Oh, this thing is bad. You know, she has an increasing lesion, it margins and shape are bad. Well, when we go to ultrasound, we found this. Kind of benign looking. Is this a complicated cyst? And in fact, when we stuck a needle in, it sort of went away. Could this even be a cyst that we aspirated or that we cored and we punctured and is gone now? What if you have this after core biopsy? Before core, these are the inferior breasts and mammographically, you have your clip and the lesion's gone. And this is pathology. You have benign breast epithelium, no atypia. Remember pathologic image, imaging concordance? Do you have that? The answer is no. And your next management plan should be a rebiopsy, and most of us would do surgical excision. And here she is presenting on the day of the wire loke, and indeed the lesion has returned. This is a specimen radiograph that demonstrates the lesion, and pathology show papillary carcinoma. Lesson here being you must have imaging pathology and clinical concordance. Okay? Clinical meaning she's a postmenopausal woman, not on hormones. She should not have new or increasing cysts. And in terms of imaging, you need to have benign features at both mammography and at ultrasound before you say this is concordant and benign lesion. Just because you have relatively benign features at ultrasound but malignant features at mammography means you cannot. So this would be discordant. Comparison with prior studies would aid in the diagnosis of cancers, which helped us in this case as well. So always, always remember the importance of concordance, which you will surely be asked about on an examination situation.